Joining us in night school, a first-time member back in class. I'm sure it's been a while since you've been in class. The preeminent broadcaster of his generation, Mr. Bob Costas. Welcome. Jeremy, thanks. I brought all of my materials, notebook, pencil sharpener, eraser. I have everything. I'm set to go for night school. All right. Fantastic. You know, Bob, the last crew to call a Triple Crown race winner in 1978 included Jack Whitaker, Jimmy the Greek, and Phyllis George back on CBS. Is there a sense of place in history for you as a broadcaster at events such as this? Well, if it should happen, then no doubt you've got to put it into some kind of context and some kind of perspective without going overboard. But we've been on the brink of this several times since NBC started doing this and since I started being involved in it. And so you set the stage, you talk about the possibilities, you talk about how long it's been, you talk about how increasingly difficult it seems to be to do it, and here we are yet again for the third time in the last four years. Um, so we're ready for it, but it hasn't happened yet. So we've, we've set the table many times, but we haven't been able uh, to put the finishing touches on it just yet. We'll see on June yeah, we'll see if dessert is served finally. Um, right, exactly. Uh, it's a triple crown more like the Grand Slam to you in tennis or golf, you know, winning individual events that, that go together as a sequence, or is it more of a, an accomplishment like Wilt scoring 100 or DiMaggio's hitting streak? I mean, how do you look at it as a broad-range sports broadcaster? I don't think there's an exact parallel or analogy within sports. I think maybe the Grand Slam would be – uh, the best in tennis or, or in golf. Hopefully those are four events rather than three. And who knows exactly what's going through the head of a horse when it comes to pressure uh, and expectations and understanding of everything that's going around them, going on around them, the way a tennis player or, or a golfer might. Uh, I think Wilt scoring 100, as great an achievement as that was, was a one-off type thing. Uh, it was an amplification of what he was doing. He averaged 50 points that season but it was a one-off type thing. Uh, the DiMaggio hitting streak might be a little bit closer, but again, within one season uh, and not attached to specific events except for successive games. So I think the Triple Crown kind of stands alone and, and partially because it's the only thing involving non-humans that Americans follow closely in terms of sports. There was a question I had for you towards the end, but I want to follow up on it now if we can. Does the fact that the horses can't talk make it easier or harder to tell the story of horse racing to the mainstream public? <laughs> well, since Mr. Ed has never been entered in a Triple Crown race, um, I guess we just accept it. And in a way, it makes it easier. Uh, the connections have their, their stories. Uh, the trainers, the jockeys, the owners, uh, they're always backstories. And there's something beautiful and glamorous about horses in a certain context. There are also, let's be honest, some objections uh, to horse racing and some of the practices within horse racing and some debate even within the sport uh, among people who love it about how they should proceed. But there's, all, there's also a beauty when the horses come around the turn and, the, and they're, they're framed by the twin spires uh, at Churchill Downs, or when you see how beautiful Belmont Park can be and the expectation when a Triple Crown is on the there's something there's something romantic about it at its best that I think draws people in, including people who can't even read a racing form. One of your great passions, obviously, the folks who followed your career is baseball. We know that about you. And, and to me, there are a lot of parallels about horse racing fans and baseball fans and that there's a cerebral element to it. The kind of guy who's going to fill out a score and keep that tucked away, sensing that there could be history tonight, is the same kind of person who may want to pick apart the past performances and, mm -hmm. and, and study a game. The, the back of a baseball card meant so much to youth, you know, of, of studying and looking at past performances. Do you see some parallels in the statistical history of baseball and horse racing that, uh, you know, may draw the two fans uh, groups together a bit? Yeah, I do see the, the parallel there uh, that, that you're drawing. I do see validity in that, except we have to concede that baseball continues on as something which tens of millions of Americans follow on a regular basis, whereas horse racing, which probably at one time 
was among the big three in American sports, baseball, boxing, horse racing. Well, the second two have faded from the mainstream. Boxing's hardly ever in the mainstream anymore. Mayweather Pacquiao was, and it was a gigantic disappointment. But for a generation at least, um, boxing has been entirely a niche in sport. Horse racing emerges for the Triple Crown races and for the Breeders' Cup as a mainstream thing, and then it recedes again until the Kentucky Derby comes back. So it, it uh, it's not running neck and neck, uh, to use a, sure. a bad metaphor uh, here. It's not running neck and neck any longer uh, with baseball in terms of public fascination or popularity. But I do see the idea that some people who follow baseball um, are – immersed in its history, immersed in statistical minutia, and the same thing is true in horse racing. Baseball had a bit of a integrity problem with the PEDs and, and the social yep. McGuire era and things like that, and now they're getting some of the pace of the game questions uh, about baseball that needs to quicken up to be for today's drive through society and video game society. What do you think is a bigger problem in sports, the, the integrity or the pace in making it sellable because in baseball, that's you know what has been talked about over the past decade. But in horse racing, the same kind of conversations happen uh, within us in the industry. Well, baseball's already made inroads this year. Um, I'm surprised by how much measurable success they've had in quickening the pace and time of games. It isn't just the time, which you see at the end. They've taken like eight to ten minutes off, depending upon what week we're measuring it. Uh, and they're headed in the right direction. But it's all, it also, just watching a game, it feels as if the pace is a little bit less dragging uh, than it used to be. So, so they've, made, they've made some steps in the right direction. Uh, integrity of competition is always the primary thing in any sport. Uh, sports are human enterprises. There are going to be flaws. There's going to be hypocrisy. There's going to be greed. There are going to be all the things that, that you know, diminish uh, – something and take it away from perfection but at the heart of it the most important thing is that the people viewing it can be sure that the competition itself is on the up and up that's at the core of it if you don't have that you have nothing then it might as well be wrestling professional wrestling not olympic or amateur wrestling um so that's always a concern and it's a concern in horse racing i'm, I'm not nearly an expert in horse racing, but I know a good deal about baseball. And what happened to the record books in baseball during the steroid era is something that that's going to be difficult to put behind it, uh, for the game to put behind it, because so much of it is dependent upon history, and that, that was a real shame. Finally, you guys broadcast the Olympics on NBC. You've done it multiple times. And on a daily basis, you may take 10 different events that the – public doesn't know much about except during yep. that every four years so what we see in the triple crown like I said, it's, it's a once a year a three times a year kind of sport how do you broadcast a niche to a broad audience and make a connection well you say to yourself that you are not doing this broadcast for a rail bird who's following this most days of the year Neither do you broadcast Olympic track and field for that portion of America that knows everything about all of these competitors, everything about who are the best in the world, everything about pole vaulting technique, long jumping technique, the difference between a 200-meter race and a 100-meter race. Those things can be explained, the differences in approach. I mean, we can do the math. There's a 100-meter difference. But those things can be explained by experts. But what draws people to the Olympics, at least Americans to the Olympics, to sports that they would seldom follow outside the context of the Olympics, is the whole idea of the panorama of the Olympic Games, the global stage, the drama of it, this idea that these competitors come once every four years at most and maybe once in a lifetime to this tremendous moment. Not to give them a reason to be interested, a reason to care about or root for this particular person, a reason to understand what's at stake. There's a, there's a backstory aspect to it that isn't required when um, football teams take the field or when baseball teams take the field. And I think that NBC's longstanding familiarity with how to do that at the Olympics, 
not just the announcers, but the producers and the researchers and everybody else, that carries over as a triple crown. People watch the Kentucky Derby, yes, because they want to see an exciting horse race. And yes, because even if it's only once or twice a year, they're going to bet on that horse race. But they also watch it to think, gee, it would be fun to be there. The hats, the outfits, the mint juleps, the Americana part of it. If you don't know how to capture that, you can't have a good broadcast of the Kentucky Derby. And we managed to put a show on the air for three hours around a two-minute horse race. Three hours, two-minute horse race, and it gets one of the highest ratings in all of television for the year. So we must be doing something right. The ultimate pregame show, three hours for two minutes. Exactly. So the, ra- the ratio, the ratio of analysis and build-up to actual event has to be the most out of whack in all of sports. Even counting the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl is six hours long, but the game lasts three hours. That's only a two-to-one ratio. Finally, Bob, I'm going to give you a quick out here. Do you think American Pharaoh ends the Triple Crown drought? I think he has, and this comes from a non-expert. I think he has as good a chance, maybe a better chance any of the now 14 counting him since 1978 but i'd still if my life depended on it i'd still take the field bob you can put your pencil down you've completed your night school and thanks so much all right i'll await my final grade